So a number of years ago, I joined a local chess club, and this chess club decided to participate in um, some sort of club league or company league. Um, basically, a whole bunch of chess clubs get together and periodically play matches against each other and field teams of players within each club to perform in these matches. So it was decided that for this particular match, I'd be representing my team on board three of six. Um, and with that said, um, I guess that would make me the favorite uh, on that board. I'm not sure, but generally when I'm playing below board two, I tend to have really strong results. So, so with that said, uh, let's get this going. So my opponent led with knight f3. And here, I had a choice to make uh, already. I could go with what I've done in some previous tournament games. I've played moves, or I've played knight f6 before. Um, I think once or twice I've even played c5 here. And, you know, with both of those, I was never really satisfied with the positions that I got out of those openings. So tonight I decided to try to play something that might transpose into openings I've been studying more recently. Yeah, move one deep thinks. I mean, this is where you collect your emotions and figure out, like, am I trying to get an open game? Am I trying to get a closed game? What kind of thing am I aiming for? Given the match situation, given the time of day, given the day of the week, given how much energy you had, given when you had dinner, and you just have to figure out what is intuitively the right move for this. So I picked d5. d5 is just trying to transpose into what I've been studying lately, um, which would be the Slav. Uh, so. Yeah, my opponent plays c4. He's trying to get into some sort of anti... Well, trying to get into either a queen's gambit or some, some kind of anti-English thing, which I haven't seen very much of. Yeah, I'm pretty high-rated USCF. I forget exactly what it is, but with that said... After c4, it's pretty clear he's not aiming for your typical uh, position. I mean, I could just take the pawn, and then he does queen a4 check and queen takes pawn, or he has other ways he could choose to collect it. Um, I could transpose into a queen's gambit declined, where I haven't really looked at the theory for that in quite a while, nor have I played much or had much experience with it. I'm already out of my book for, say, a Peartz, because those start with d6 instead of d5. And I'm not getting a Grunfeld, because uh, my opponent hasn't played knight c3 yet. So, there's a lot of things I could choose to do here. I hadn't really prepped for this particular opening. Uh, c4 was probably the least expected thing on the board. Uh, so I played c6. And this on the move d4 would transpose back into the Slav and give me a good chance at getting a position that I've seen before. Um, and I think my opponent and I both recognize this as he tried uh, taking on d5. Or rather, that's what he played. This gives me a choice. Do I want to take back? And then if he plays d4, we have an exchange Slav proper. Um, which has a symmetrical pawn structure, and it's very hard for me to try to win it. And um, our team was kind of in a must-win situation tonight. So I decided, you know what? Taking with the pawn gets an equal position. Uh, taking with the queen at least preserves some imbalances and gives me some hope of trying to win this. This is what I played. Um, and then my opponent responds with knight c3, hitting my queen, gaining a tempo. So this is a risk I run, is that I'm allowing him to harass my queen and develop with tempo and um, make things confusing. Well, 
I'm hoping to complicate things anyway. So I could play like queen a5 or queen d8. These would be expected normal moves in the position. I probably should have played one of those moves. But as I'm already not so familiar with this particular position, I uh, elected to just play queen d6 here, which is pretty abnormal. Objectively, it's probably bad, um, because this allows white to later gain a tempo with bishop f4. And although I thought I had clever things against that, it's really not so clever. And d8 or a5 make a lot more sense. Even though those will make it obvious for my opponent what he should be doing next, um, they're still objectively better moves than what I played. So, opponent continues g3, um, both allowing his bishop a space to develop. Because you see his bishop's not going to go to b5, his knight's not going to b5. There's nothing to harass on this side. And if he goes bishop c4, I could play b5 at some point. So he decides he wants to just fianchetto the bishop, and this additionally gives some support for a future bishop f4 move. So that's what's going on here. Yeah, it's kind of like a Scandinavian, except it's gone poorly for black. Um, and this is just due to poor opening choice on my part. But at least I'm getting a position that I kind of sort of feel a little bit at home in. Given that I've played um, before, i played like the King's Indian, I've played the Grunfeld, I've played um, the Peerts. I'm kind of familiar with this sort of pawn structure, even if objectively what I've went for here just is bad. It's better to have a plan than no plan at all. Um, so anyway. Um, and here I played what must be a strange move for this particular opening. So it's clear my bishop isn't doesn't really have a home. I don't even know where it's supposed to go. Um, like if I want to go bishop b7, I have to deal with the fact that the c pawn's in the way. Yeah, e4, d4 looks a lot more incisive than what actually happened. We'll get to the result, okay, man? You gotta play the game first. So, I decided to fianchetto because this is something I'm kind of more familiar with, even if um, it's a bit off the beaten path, and it's not the most accurate way to develop. And we'll see it leads to complications later. But... Let's get past the opening, because I have a lot I can learn about openings. Um, probably many of you know some of these openings better than I do. Again, e4 and d4 seem a lot more incisive, at least at first glance, and they probably are. Um, I'm just trying to provoke my opponent to make some sort of committal move, so I'll have something to attack. Um, Upload this on Leeches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you all want to just talk about what the computer evaluation for the game is. Whatever. I'm just going to continue on with my analysis. So, here I continue knight b to d7. Um, the point being that if he plays bishop f4, I think I can answer e5. Let me first enter the move that he did play, and we can go back and then look at this. So what if he plays bishop f4 here? Play e5, and if knight takes... Actually, yeah, this doesn't necessarily work so well. And I pointed this out to my teammates after the game that, you know, I might have goofed here. The point is that I can't move the knight away because I would lose my queen. Um, but I do have plenty of pieces attacking the e5 square. And the problem is that it just takes me some time to round up the pawn. And with all this lost time and lost space, um, white could surely do something. Not just going to sit back and um, do nothing like while I'm recollecting this pawn. So, bishop f4 is okay, but I guess I do get the pawn back. Um, but surely there must be a better way for white to play than what happened. Okay, so 
Yeah, the game continued Queen C2, which is a good logical developing move. I castle. And for whatever reason, he chooses to play h3. I guess he's trying to deny my knight the square and deny my bishop the square. So I won't have the opportunity to trade my bishop. And it'll be difficult for me to find useful squares for my knights because his pawns are just cutting off these squares. He's playing passively. He hasn't really made any super committal move yet. Um, this gives me a tempo to do whatever I feel like doing. And what I feel like doing here is just developing my bishop this way, because my bishop's not going to go out to g4. Going to f5 now would be kind of questionable on account of a future g4, g5 push that might happen, or e4 or e5. So I re recognize that either my bishop's going to d7, and then I guess to c6 from there, or I'm just going to fianchetto it. And I know the double fianchetto generally is a bad idea, because like it leads to all kinds of rigidity with your pawn structure, and makes it difficult for you to harmoniously develop anything. Um, but I've already kind of goofed in this opening, so I'm admitting my mistake. I'm just saying that if you're going to give me some time, I'll take that time and put my bishop on a good square, and then oppose your bishop. And so I'm putting the onus on white to do something productive with uh, his moves while I embark on this really slow plan. So yeah, he decides that he wants to start attacking my C pawn right away. There might be more accurate ways to do this, like he might have knight g5 or knight h4. Um, he might have some pawn pushes in the center. There are a lot of things he could try here, but this is the move he ended up playing. So I just continue with my idea. I'm going to oppose his bishop on this long diagonal and then see what he can come up with. Um, incidentally, this is probably why I should study openings a little bit more, so I'm not like behind uh, out of the opening. But this way, at least I'm able to play a game and avoid my opponent's theory knowledge and get a position that I'm kind of sort of familiar with and have a good feel for the position. Um, so yeah, he just continues. He's just developing, giving his bishop a place to go, hitting my queen. Um, I recognize that, say, if I play queens... Well, okay, I'll play the move I did play first. So I dropped my queen back to b8. I noticed that if I play my queen back to c7... There's this annoying thing, like this pin along the C file. And so this, I mean, this allows for so many tactical opportunities that I just don't even want to see. Um, I'm not saying that there's anything concrete at the moment, but C7 is not an ideal square for the queen. Um, you know, I'm not sure what my opponent's rating is. I'll have to look it up sometime. Maybe after the broadcast I'll take a look at it. I know he, he's a pretty reasonably strong player because he knows his openings and he was pushing for um, equality or pushing for a slight edge out of the opening and didn't want to make things unclear at all. Like here he plays a4. It's, I mean he's doing a lot of really good sane developing moves. So at this point, it doesn't really matter what his rating is, as long as he's playing good moves. Um, so in response to a4, I say, well, okay, you're threatening to play a5, and a takes b6. I ended up playing c5. Note for a second that I could technically play a5 here, um, but this really weakens the b-pawn. You don't want to... Um, give yourself backward pawns like this. Um, don't do this, ever. <laughs> Unless you have like a really good tactical or development related reason to uh, lock up your pawns and make them rigid and make them easy targets to attack. Try to avoid pushing pawns in that manner. So, instead of that, I decide that I'm going to oppose the bishops, and I'm taking the d4 square away from him. So this is 
a pretty slow action battle. Um, and here my opponent seized the moment and played bishop f4. Um, I ended up playing queen c8, but I had intended to play e5. However, e5 doesn't work here. Uh, it looks like it works, but uh, how did this go again? I think, yeah, bishop takes bishop. So I'm threatening the rook. Then if queen takes, then he can take e5. And there's other lines too. Um, but this is just one way that he can win the pawns. I can't play e5 to stop the bishop. Yeah, so c5 is good, but I have to acknowledge that I'm giving my opponent a tempo to attack my queen. And fortunately for me, um, that tempo doesn't really mean very much in this position because I developed all my pieces first. So now white's just catching up. That's what that tempo is all about, is white um, maintaining his small positional edge and finally equalizing on development. Um, and here, okay, so white sees that he doesn't want to trade these bishops. Although I kind of felt that he had to, or he had to do something. Um, I wasn't sure exactly what white was going to do here. Like, note if white plays e4, uh, I could play e5, or I, I, there's a various things I could do there, but d3 gets weakened severely. Um, so my opponent took a really artificial look at this position. Um, I, and he came up with this move, and I do not understand it. I mean, sure, it stops the trade of the bishops. Sure, it controls space in the center. Sure, if it were a hedgehog and these pawns were on the queen side, this sort of thing would be pretty common. But you're pushing the pawns in front of your king, and you're blocking your bishop. Um, there's one more point here, and I'm not sure if any of you guys can see it, but what do you think what would happen? My opponent did play f3. How do you think that I would respond to a move like this? Other than saying, ew, it's a really ugly move. Because, I mean, that that's a pretty natural response, too. This is the part where I interact with my audience. And depending how good you guys are, maybe I'll give you guys more chances in this game to come up with opportunities um, to find the right moves. But, you know, if you guys fail this one really badly, um, then I might, um, I might just play out the game and give my analysis. You best by test. Brilliant. <laughs> so it seems that people really want to move this knight off of f6 um, Ray is saying move the knight to h5 Beats is saying move the knight to d5 yeah either way the motivation of these moves I assume either attack something or to give the bishop here on g7 a little bit more range to attack things. Um, so I'm just running my mouth a little bit, hoping uh, to get a little bit more commentary, but okay. 
my guess is that probably as far as you get your guys' analysis is going to go this stream. Um, so I guess um, with that I'll just go into what actually happened here. Uh, I did play knight to h5. So um, point one is that it helps me develop my bishop on g7. Um, and because my bishop is developed or attacking along these squares, this also gives me the ability, should I want to, I'm constantly threatening to play e5. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is that this vacates the f6 square that gives my other knight a place to go to, because notice that this knight is kind of blocked here by these pawns. Um, the third thing is that it puts the knight on the rim, which, as we all know, a knight on the rim is awesome. So, yeah. But fourth, there is an actual um, tactical justification for this also at, at the same time. So, note that if this bishop, which is attacked by the knight, decides to move away, the g3 pawn hangs. Um, this is kind of a problem for white. So white has to deal with uh, the threat to the g3 pawn and the threat to the bishop. And it's not so clear how white's supposed to do this. I suppose, well, one thing, oh, yeah, okay, so let me first share the game move, just so Lee just doesn't get confused as to what actually happened. So the game continued king h2, but note that say he decides to defend his bishop with move like, um, yeah, queen d2. Well, this e5, the bishop has to move somewhere. Uh, so he goes to e3, and then I could snatch the pawn here. So yeah, at this point, um, I'm just threatening to double his pawns. Oh, how is e5 a threat? Well, okay, let's say he plays something like queen d2. Again, I could play e5. The point of e5 isn't so much to... Um, to have the pawn win material, because that's not going to happen, but to displace white's pieces and control space in the center, and incidentally win the g-pawn. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, you meant how many pieces do I have defending e5? Yeah, I see what you mean. It is a little bit late. So, yeah, here he plays king h2. And I seize the day, and I double his pawns. Now he's got a bishop that's on the same color as most of his pawns, and two pawns that stand in front of the bishop that are double. And he's got a half-open g-file, uh, and a pawn island here, and a pawn island here, and a pawn island there. So, white will play knight d6 first after immediate e5. Ah, right. Yeah. So, if white's going to go through the trouble here, um, he might as well get something for his trouble. So, yeah. He's going to play knight d6 and then take the bishop. And then supposing I take the knight uh, and win the pawn, this is how it would continue. g3 still hangs. But, yeah, white would not just go idly by and just allow me to win the g3 pawn without at least getting, um, although, yeah, this is kind of problematic. I didn't imagine this. A little bit tricky. But sure, white's giving up all the pieces in the vicinity of his king. If he wants to, he can trade... I'm not sure how this all works out. 
Um, those interested, feel free back home to analyze the game afterward, look at it with an engine, whatever. Yeah, this is a lot more complicated than I imagined. Possibly queen takes b7 is not accurate. In fact, yeah, the knight's trapped. Why don't I just take here instead? So the knight's not going anywhere. And the bishop can't protect it. This is probably... Well, okay, so... Ah, but if g4, then queen takes pawn's not possible anymore. Because my queen defends this, and the pawn doesn't attack it anymore. This would actually work okay for um, black. This would be a-okay, since... Despite all appearances, practically things work out. Unless there's some other tradition Zug going on. Say he doesn't take b7 right away, I guess? Like, takes... I don't know. This is where it gets confusing. Yeah. And this is quite a rich game for you guys to um, mull over with your engine if you really like to do that sort of thing. But I'm just um, putting this game out there because I thought there were a lot of interesting things that happened in the actual game also. Um, but after G takes F4, I see that this is starting to open up. Uh, and I just decide that, you know what? If one knight on h5 can be good, two knights on h5's got to be even better. The knights on the rim are awesome. And again, my opponent should probably play something to solidify his center, um, to help his development, or at least to give his rooks some active lines to go to. There are so many things white should be doing to activate his pieces and seize the moment. Um, White does possibly the most aggressive and least called for move in the position. He plays e4. And at this point, um, so I've managed to somehow provoke my opponent into making, like, moving his pawns over and over and over. Don't ask me how. I just tend to have that effect on people, I guess. Or they just love pawn pushing. Maybe it's because they get positions and they're like, they're thinking that they're so much better uh, in the position just by the virtue that they control a lot of space. And I tend to prefer, prefer positions either where I'm up on material or I have really good attacking chances and good development. Um, so... I don't mind getting a entirely unsound position and then trying to win it. I don't mind that at all. Well, actually, I kind of mind, because I don't like getting positions where my opponents have all the attacking chances. But, um, regardless, I take a lot of chances and risks. That's what makes the game fun for me, is the whole adventure of who knows what's going to happen next. So here he plays e4, which is about the last thing I expected, given how my opponent started the game trying to go into an exchange slav, and um, I've managed to pull him way outside his comfort zone at the moment, and I just continue developing. And now look, um, I've got access to g3, I've got access to f4. If I want to, I could potentially play like queen d8, queen h4, I could play queen c7, I could play bishop h6. And once I develop my rooks, um, who knows what's going to happen next. Meanwhile, he's got doubled pawns in front of the bishop, double pawns in front of the rook, and two pawns on the diagonal in front of the bishop, a backward pawn on d3, a backward pawn on b4, and three pawn islands. Um, so White's really got to figure out what he's going to do to get 
more harmonious development of his pieces and his pawns. Um, but at the moment, White's not really too interested in that. In fact, uh, White has to also deal with the fact that the F pawn is hanging. So you could either play F5, maybe, and try to gambit it, or you could do what he did in the game and defend the pawn. Um, I'll spare you guys a lot of the variations here and just say I played queen c7 to pin the pawn here to connect the rooks and potentially um, this pin might be useful later. Um, and here he plays the move I expected him to play. Yeah, I agree, f4 is weak. And him playing e5, which I, I expected, because this is a move that easily defends the f-pawn um, and appears to shut my bishop out of the game. And just at first glance, this looks kind of sort of reasonable. Um, uh, what should have really tipped my opponent's, um, or what should have been the clue to him, is that, look, um, this is a backward pawn, this is a backward pawn, this is a backward pawn, this is a backward pawn. So he might have three pawn islands, but now he's got some, I'm just going to say he's got a pawn archipelago, where he's got all kinds of backward pawns and islands and isolanis and doubled pawns. It's just an archipelago. Yeah, so I'm kind of curious. Um, there's a lot of variations. Um, the move I ended up playing is f6, but I think Zvish is asking at this move, move 20, should I just play bishop h6 here? Um, or maybe Z uh, Zwish is asking at move 19, should I play bishop h6 back here? Um, Certainly these are both possible, and I think, yeah, there's there's a lot of tactics, so we can start to get into this here. Um, let's start with 20 bishop h6. The point is that I'm harassing this backward pawn, that if advanced I just do pawn takes pawn, if nothing else. Um, you guys are saying knight takes f4. Well, okay, since there's a lot of discussion about this here, yeah, that, there's kind of a problem with that. So, yeah, if I immediately take an f4, take, take, and I've got two pieces attacking and pinning and trying to win this, take, take, uh, queen d2. I could play. I could play g5 to pin and win the knight. Um, that's one sample variation, but I thought I saw something wrong with this during the game. Uh, I thought there was some reason it didn't quite work out. Um, what might that have been? Maybe I was just imagining things. Maybe this does really work out, because queen takes. Queen d2 appears to be the best move to defend it. Um, although, arguably, after g5, maybe there's king g3. And maybe I'm not winning any material here after all. And white can play rook e1 to follow. Um, this is getting kind of dodgy here, but I think, well, okay, let's look at this a little bit further. So pawn takes, queen takes, queen takes, b2. Um, so I've won a pawn, but I don't think I'm going to win this endgame. Yeah. As fun as this variation looks, um, yeah, really we've opened up 
position just a little bit, and unfortunately, neither of our rooks benefit from that. And our queen on b2 is kind of sidelined. So, sure, we've won a pawn. Sure, I love my winning pawns. I definitely am all over that. Um, but I don't think that winning this endgame is going to be anywhere near easy. Yeah, we're up two pawns, so... I don't know, maybe Zug, maybe Zug Addict could win this against a computer. Um, but I don't know against a human. This might be tricky. On the other hand, my opponent has four pawn islands, and I only have three. Um, so maybe there's a reasonable chance of winning this. One thing that really complicates this is that White has both a pair of rooks and a queen. Each of which make the end games really not that promising. Um, is there a way that White can regain at least one pawn before we start going into end game stuff? Like, what about Queen C7? Well, I guess D3 is hanging. So, how do I take D3 without allowing the bishop to attack A8? Oh yeah, and if white wins the A pawn and the B pawn, uh, this becomes a threat too. Let me not forget that. Um, but all I'll say is, I think Zush is completely right, that we don't even want to go here. So sure, taking F4 might win a pawn, but that pawn's not going anywhere. Go back and look at this. I mean, if this pawn steps forward to f5, we just do pawn takes pawn, right? Arguably, if this pawn moves forward, maybe e5 is hanging, and we take that instead. Or maybe we choose not to take either. Maybe we choose to, like, play f6 and try to open up the file for the rook. Or maybe we play rook d8 and try to win the d-pawn. Or maybe we just forget about all the pawns and try to go for mate somehow. So there's a lot of things we could try here. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I think White truly is down two pawns there, but chances of him getting this A pawn uh, advanced and exchanging some pawns on the queen side are pretty high. And if all the pawns on the queen side exchange, then White's drawing chances greatly improve. So, yeah, I... I think there's a lot more that black could be aiming for here. And with that, I actually played f6. So rather than trying to win a pawn, I'm just going to preserve the position as it stands now and try to get my rook into the game and just count on my superior development being able to maybe eventually win a pawn some other way. Lots of hooks in there. That's for sure. Um, so here, and I'm not going to try to explain my opponent's rationale, not in too much depth, but yeah, f6 looks really powerful. And that's, this is kind of why I'm proud of the game. Because I thought I had a really, really good play here. Um, or I thought I played this well. So even though I have these tactics that might win a pawn that might get me into a better endgame, I choose to just stay in the middle game and try to complicate things even further and just make the best use of my development. Um, so my opponent plays rook e1. One could argue that this helps support the e5 pawn, so that as soon as this knight moves somewhere, um, then e5 is going to be supported. So, arguably, this is a reasonably strong move. It, um, in completely in abstract, not looking at um, the fact that there's still a knight here that has to go somewhere. Um, yeah, this is totally reasonable. So, I continue development. I recognize that my bishop no longer hits this rook that soon enough this pawn on b2 is going to be moving away. 
And so I want to move my bishop to somewhere it can like get outside my pawns. So I move it to bishop. I move bishop h6, hitting f4 yet again, starting to cut off and cut into some of the space on this diagonal. So like knight e3 would potentially get the pawn pinned. White well, can't really play moves like queen d2 and rook c1, and this is really a nuisance for white more than anything else. Also, it introduces um, the fact that this pawn on f4 is attacked twice, so white's kind of got to do something about that. Even if perhaps the same thing for white to do is just say, you know what? I don't care about this pawn. I'm just going to develop somehow get some peace activity, and let black be up a pawn, and see where we go from there. Um, well, this is a slow game, so I had a lot of time to think about things. Um, so, my opponent actually did choose to just play f5. And he's saying, you know, fine, I'll give away the pawn, and I'm going to hope that by playing f4 next, I'm going to reduce the scope of the bishop, increase the scope of my rook, increase the scope of my bishop, and maybe give my knight something useful to do. So this really helps to open white's position and give him um, the development he's sorely been lacking because he's been pushing pawns all opening. Finally, um, pushing pawns has got them out of the way of his pieces. Um, I mean, once you push the pawns far enough ahead, um, they're no longer in the way of your pieces because you're just giving the pawns away. Um, ah, so here we have an idea. So let me first input the game move. I played F takes E. Uh, Zwish is hoping that I play bishop f4 check. The thought did cross my mind during the game. This is definitely a candidate move I had in mind. Um, um, I guess I just didn't want to trade, but I'm confused. Oh, I didn't... <laughs> I'm very confused at this point. So, suppose I did play this. I expect what would happen would be knight takes, knight takes. Um, and then I'm threatening the bishop on g2. And this just improves the scope of this bishop on b7. Um, I'm confused for various reasons here. Yeah. Certainly my knight on f4 is strong, and this shuts out his bishop pretty much permanently. Um, this might have been the strongest thing to do in the position. Because I can anchor that knight. I could play g5, and if he plays h4, I could play h6. And the only piece that could potentially expel my knight would be his knight. And it would be quite an arduous journey for his knight to get somewhere where it can actually attack my knight without hanging it. Um, yeah, this would be quite strong, at least for the knight. Um, during the game, I was really a lot more alarmed about the possibility of either the E file opening or the diagonal here just being an open like uh, I was really worried my opponent might have open season on my king especially if I start trading down but this monster knight this is incredible um, so yeah, I could follow with moves like rook d8, threatening the d-pawn. There's really not a whole lot white can do. Um, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. I'll take a look at this closer 
uh, after the stream because I really want to understand um, what White's opportunities are for active play. That is a monster knight, but somehow, I don't know. And I certainly get that it's a monster of a knight. Um, I guess what if he doesn't trade? What if he plays... I don't know, King H1 maybe. It mimics what often happens in Nimzo with the C4 weakness. Oh, I see. I've never... I'm sure I've read Sokolov's book on the Nimzo Indian. But it's been a really long time, so I didn't recognize this. And yeah, this is this illustrates complete and total dominance over a color complex. In this case, instead of dominating all the light squares like in the Nimzo, here we're dom dominating all the dark squares. There's not a whole lot white can do. Um, Granted, it's going to be a really long time before Black's attack smashes through, but White is really tied up at the moment. No, no, no. Knight g3, you just take the knight. Come on. Um, I mean, you might not even have to take the knight because the bishop is temporarily hanging, but... Um, It's a very strong idea. Certainly it's much clearer than what I played. I played was just taking on e5. And here I still do intend to develop and possibly play bishop f4 check. But also I'm threatening things like, I don't know, rook takes or rook plays to f5 and then rook g5. Then my other rook could come out and support this attack. Um, and this gets really, really contentious pretty quickly. Whereas the line that Zwish was recommending, black just has a small plus and not very much danger to contend with. Here, I'm playing some risky moves because um, I'm trying to win the game outright in an instant. Uh, and this has a lot of potential to backfire. So, yeah. Let's take a look at what actually happens in the game. Um, I continue by taking an e5. He takes g6, so he's threatening to follow with like d4 and pawn takes pawn and get his queen onto g6. Fortunately, I see I have enough time to take back and secure the structure. Um, the game continued king g1. Note that if he actually played d4, this is check. And then after this check, then I just defend the pawn. And I'm up however many pawns, and I got a passed pawn, and this is just crushing. So white has to play king g1. Ah, yeah, black has a lot of safety in the other line. And that knight on f4 is quite the monster. Yeah, this is this is okay. Um, if white has active play in this position, then it's not as strong as I think it is. But I continue king h7 here, and man, I was both myself during the game, my opponent during the game. And everybody I showed the game to afterward was just really struggling to find a constructive move for white here. Um. Oh, I see. GF5. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, 
I guess if we're going to go back and look at this, King G1, yeah, just GF5, and crashes through pretty quickly. So we're not going to see, oh. See if knight takes, knight takes. I don't know, somehow I'm just paranoid about things, about my opponent's attacks that aren't actually there. Whereas somehow here I felt safer even though this is much more risky. That shows what I know <laughs> and how much I have to learn. Um, yeah, I play King H7. And as I was saying, both myself and my opponent and my teammates just really struggle to find a constructive move for white. Ultimately, um, white settled on playing queen c. Um, this attacks the e pawn a second time. Okay, very well. Uh, so I could choose to either like bring my bishop back to defend the pawn, which in my opinion is a bit cowardly. But I ultimately resolved to defend the pawn this way with my rook. One thing I considered was, well, again, something like bishop f4. But here it's pretty clear that white's pieces um, do enter the game pretty quickly. Now e5 is hanging, and after e5 drops, potentially e7 hangs too. So I would need to consider something like this, and I just didn't want to go here at all, because clearly I felt I had better with just rook, e, rook f5. Trying to activate my final rook. And I noticed one important tactic here. And what I noticed, and this actually came up in the game, is, well, what if my opponent plays knight c1? Now he's got three pieces hitting my poor pawn on e5. And so I could either choose to use my bishop to defend it. I could try to gambit it. I could try to go for some kind of crazy attack or counterattack. Note that the knight on c1 defends d3, so something like rook d8 isn't so strong. Um, so, last move I did a lot of calculating, and... Even the move before that, and I kept expecting to see this knight c1 happen. Finally, my opponent, very interested in trying to win my e5 pawn, and after winning e5, maybe get some activity against e7, he plays this knight c1. And you gotta be thinking to yourself, boy, at this point, I'd love to just, um, love to continue attacking somehow. If only there was some way to really uh, break through without losing the center first. Yeah, I could defend with bishop f4, and we could get a pretty static position, and I just have a static positional plus that has really good um, attacking chances too. I could lock the position up with a move like bishop f4 and ha enjoy a pretty clear plus there. There's, yeah, no question that bishop f4 is pretty solid, and it's a good move. I went for something way more exciting than bishop f4 here. Uh, and I wouldn't expect anybody to guess this. So, in this position I played bishop takes knight which looks absolutely crazy from every positional perspective that you could possibly take on it. I'm trading my awesome bishop for this terrible knight, which only defends on the d3 square, and potentially e2. So I'm, the reason I'm doing this 
Yeah. No, playing solidly is definitely a good thing, especially as you approach higher levels in chess. Um, well, okay. It's good that you guys are considering these captures and checks and things. I mean, this is how you figure out what your candidate moves are, right? Now, I think a lot of people would dismiss this bishop c1 without looking too far into it. Um, so, uh, let me first enter the game move. The game move was queen c1. Uh, alternative was rook c1. And here, all the white's pieces are misplaced, and really, it's it's pretty clear that black's attack is going to crash through first, after something like knight f4 and rook g5 and rook a f8 and rook f5. This is just really powerful and pretty overwhelming. So if like knight f4, they have this rook back, because otherwise f3 might hang in some of these lines. And rook g5, sure e5 is hanging, but the bishop is also hanging. And there, you can't play rook e2 because I play knight takes rook winning the queen. And playing rook f2 would walk into this fork. So... Yeah, knight f4 is just awesome. This is, I mean, this is one monster of a knight. Especially because the knight's no longer defending d3 and e2. Especially because, also, um, I've got e5 locked down. So this one tempo it takes deflecting the rook away gets me a very critical tempo for the attack. And... I mean, what's White going to do? I guess he has to play knight e3 to defend this. And I'm not able to crash through and just win outright. Shame on me. This is just crushing somehow. I mean, I could still play rook d8 or rook f8 and bishop a6 and who knows what. The, I mean, there's limitless potential for attack here. And white is tied down really badly. So, yeah, that f4 outpost is really strong as the material gets reduced here. And note that my bishop, if it were on h6, wouldn't be doing anything in this position. And I'd be looking for, well, how do I get the bishop somewhere useful? And maybe somehow I'd find a way to do it. But um, let me continue with the game. Because the game is also interesting. So I played knight f4 in the game. And so, my opponent here calls my bluff. So, it looks like I can't play knight f4. So, and maybe I can't. I'm not sure. Um, you know, as I'm starting to look at this, maybe I erred during the game. Although my knight on f4 does attack a lot of things. Wait, no, I think I got this. So, the move that was played in the game was knight takes e5. Another variation to consider is rook takes e5. However, here, I can fork the rook and the queen and win material. Okay. So, the game continued knight takes e5. And it looks like this works, right? How would you continue for black here? Yeah. Yeah, I think this bishop takes c1 was an excellent prophylactical move because it makes this knight on f4 a total monster that can't be removed on account of some completely wild and insane tactics that result. But how would you play against this knight takes e5?
And my opponent thought he could get away with this, because, I mean, you could say maybe my rook is overworked, because it's both defending e5 and defending the knight. Um, so you could say maybe this was the thing that my opponent was looking at. Maybe this is what... Um, Maybe this is where he stopped and saw that this is probably okay for white. Alright, so I'm going to give this maybe another minute. If I'm not getting any input, then I'm probably just going to go uh, advance through the game. All right, so we got a couple of people suggesting rook takes knight. And we have knight takes g2. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's a shame to lose this beautiful knight. So let me first point out, uh, if we did do rook takes knight, then we have queen takes knight here. And our rook is pinned to the queen. Um, and this is just bad news. Um, so yeah, you don't want to get into this position. So, yeah, the correct move here is knight takes g2. Uh, with the point that we're attacking this rook on e1. We're also attacking their knight on e5, so um, white has to come up with something. Um, and really the best that white came up with, or at least this is what he played, uh, was just take the knight here. And then, so I can't do queen takes knight because the rook's defending it, so I can do rook takes. Um, and then, uh, let's see. The game continued rook takes rook, but here he could have played queen f4. You see what would have happened here. So a minute ago we were looking at another variation um, where white could play queen f4. What's different here? I mean, this looks pretty crushing, right? Because the rook's pinned to the queen. And the rook's attacked twice, and there's no way to bring another piece just to defend the rook. Yeah. So rook e2 here is the key. So I think this is probably what my opponent missed um, way back here. And I've been trying to... In fact... If you go back a little bit more, this is the position where I decided to exchange my bishop for the knight on account of my attack being super strong. And to be honest, I didn't fully appreciate that this queen f4 was dangerous. I just happened to luck out that my opponent's king ended up on g2. So some might call that intuition, or some might call that... Um, I don't look at moves that lose the game instantly, but um, I mean, you could argue that, well, sure, I didn't need to see that move because it's refuted. That's kind of a silly notion. Anyway, um, yeah, the game continued, rook takes, queen takes, and here I'm up a bishop for how many pawns? Oh, I'm up a bishop for zero pawns. That's not bad. I'll take that. Um, yeah, he develops rook e1. I protect my pawn. Um, here he's trying to be a little bit tricky, so he plays king g1. Note that if I take this pawn, um, potentially bad things could happen to my king. So I say, nope, none of that. 
We're just gonna develop. Um, here he plays queen e3. Again, if I take on f3 and I'm trying to be clever, well, okay, first let me just continue with what happened here. I played rook f7, but no, there are chances for me to mess this up. Um, so, over here, I could take f3. We could get this position, and if I take with the rook, I lose my bishop to this fork on e7, so I have to do bishop takes. Then we got this check. And then I develop, and I mean, I'm probably still winning this, but let's not even go there. So we play an accurate move. We just defend e7. Um, and now we really are threatening to take on f3. So what does white do about this? Well, at this point, white's getting a little bit flustered. Um, he decides he doesn't want this pawn on f3 anymore, because if I take f3, I'm forking the queen and a mate threat on g2. So he pushes. And then I play this. And after this we uh, decide to stop the clock, shake hands, and call it a night. Yeah. So I thought this is a pretty awesome game. Um, from all the way back... Well, okay, where do I start to really get some momentum? I think this momentum all started not with h3. No, that would be would be claiming way too much technique on my part. Um, c5, kind of, sort of. This is where my opponent needs to start coming up with some ideas. Uh, bishop f4 is a good idea. Um, yeah, I guess f3. This is where the momentum really builds largely in my favor. In a really enormous way. So, uh, from this point onward, I think I played really well. Perhaps with a few exceptions, like maybe there were some tactics that I could have safely won a pawn instead of going for this wild, complicated thing. But if there aren't multiple pieces hanging at the same time, you're probably not looking at my game. Um, my games tend to feature uh, lots of hanging pieces. And... You know, maybe if I were a professional chess player, I might not play that way. But as an amateur, I, I find this kind of play very fun and entertaining and something quite instructive I could learn a lot from. Um, should I take the time and do a proper uh, post-mortem analysis and appreciate things like this? Like, is it a good idea for me to um, get this monster knight even if I don't like have my bishop anymore, and even if I've traded it for his knight on e2. There's a lot I can learn from this, and I realize that I have a lot to learn both about middle games and openings. Not so much in the end game area, I, had, I tend to do those pretty well. But, um, yeah, I play in this very aggressive style that allows me to see a wide variety of positions in my game and gives me a lot to analyze once the game's over. And I will analyze this more offline and see if, what various improvements I can come up with. So, yeah, let me keep going forward, see if I have any more comments about this. Oh yeah, this bishop takes c1. This looks completely nuts. I'm not sure if it is nuts or not, but it just intuitively felt like the right thing to do because there wasn't anything useful to do with the bishop anymore other than plop it on f4 and sit on the position forever. And I, at the time, I just wasn't in the mood to do that. I really wanted something much more aggressive that would force my opponent to react to what I'm doing. And I know a lot of high-rated players get these binds where they'll play something like bishop f4 and just accept that they have a bind and take forever to win it. Um, unfortunately, that's not yet my style, but maybe one day I'll have a better appreciation for how to play those positions. Perhaps have the time and energy to play through them. Um, but yeah, this combination, this combination was fun. And at my level in chess, I can 
get away with playing for this really combinative approach. Um, play super aggressive moves and trade down into winning endgames. Um, at my level it works, but it's going to hold me back until um, I'm willing to play with more middle game and opening technique. And if I play with good middle game technique, I can maintain a bind and play for a positional win instead of just going for tactics every game. Yeah. A bishop takes c1 is probably good. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if somehow a computer refuted it, but a human over the board is not going to come up with something to refute this kind of play. Yeah, so... Um, well, honestly, yeah, my rating... My rating's something over 1900. I don't know why. In my opinion... Um, I think if I'm playing against a 1900, I'll probably score about even. But if I'm playing against somebody weaker, my hyper-aggressive playing style um, and strong endgame technique leads me to tend to win against lower-rated players more than it should. Um, I'll often get terrible positions against lower-rated players and then end up winning them because of technique and such. Um, but against 1900s and above, it's really an equal battle, if not an uphill one. So I'm not sure that having a single number um, represent my performance would actually make sense. So I just keep saying, like, I'm 1900, even though my technically my rating is something higher than that. Um, I'm sure that over time as I study both my own games and some master games and expert games, I'll better appreciate how to play these middle games, learn how to apply these binds, and learn how to win without having some sort of tactic that wins on the spot. Because my games tend to finish with some flourish and some tactic, and as much as that romantic style is fun, it's not realistic can't win every game with a crazy tactic. You can try, but it's it's such an uphill battle. There's so much more to learn about the game. Um, yeah. Uh, that was my game tonight. I think we all had a lot of fun looking at that together. So glad I was able to share that. I'll probably upload it to Leech Us at some point. Who knows? Um, I... Both myself and my opponent and my teammates were really entertained by it. Um, incidentally, my team won our match, I think, by a score of 3.5 to 2.5. So there's some chance that we might end up qualifying for the next uh, section. We'll see. Um, so I guess... Um, at this point, I say thanks for watching the analysis here. Uh, I might stick around to answer questions or play a couple games, but um, to anybody leaving, uh, have a good night, and I'll see you around.